Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The 720 members of the European Parliament have been elected over the several days now. This is six times the number of Knesset members here in Israel, and the impact on the ability of reaching a consensus is pretty much comparable. With the new makeup of the European Union's legislative now apparent, jockeying is now expected in the contest for the Commission's president, a position held over the last five years by Germany's Ursula von der Leyen. What are the forces shaping the new institutions of the EU, who will be the major figures in foreign policy and security, and are the implications for the Middle East already evident? To help us get to the bottom of it, we are pleased to have two distinguished European elder statesmen joining us to discuss it all the way from Germany. Retired General Klaus Naumann, who formerly served as the Bundeswehr's Chief of Defense, as well as Chairman of NATO's Military Committee. It's good to see you, General. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning indeed. Also joining us from the Kingdom of the Netherlands is Professor Uli Rosenthal, formerly a Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. It's good to see you, sir. Good to see you. It's very good to see both of you indeed. With me here in the studio, of course, our TV7 editor at large, Mr. Amir Oren. Amir, give us a broader spectrum of what are we going to discuss today. So uh, we can debate uh, the uh, effectiveness and even the raison d'etre of the European Parliament uh, and its powers vis-à-vis -vis the Commission and the Council, but we should focus for the time being on the uh, trends apparent um, by these uh, elections and their impact on the Middle East in general and Israel especially. Now, it seems uh, when we look at uh, Europe from here, and this may be simplistic, that the uh, victory, the relative one, has been of the right. But saying the right as a headline uh, is again uh, superficial. There is a wild right and there is a mild right. And a combination of those um, have apparently won over the left, whether it's the extreme left or um, uh, a more moderate left. Obviously, because of various uh, trends, migration, the uh, reaction to what has happened in Europe uh, over the last uh, several years. But again, for Israel, what is important is who will succeed Josep Borrell as uh, the high representative for um, security and foreign policy, and whether the uh, Commission uh, will adopt such policies that will push Israel to um, put the uh, accent on bilateral relations with the various European nations. Indeed. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Let's turn now to General Nauman. General, it seems like, and we've been discussing this also on Europa Stands and uh, elsewhere, uh, the, the winds have been shifting uh, throughout Europe, redirecting to the right, as Mr. Owen just mentioned, but uh, at the same time, there are concerning trends and there are positive trends, and the two are not necessarily uh, intertwined. Uh, would you care to give us a little bit of your insight? How do you see the various developments, and what are we to project out of the latest figures that have emerged in this latest election? Well, thank you. As always, uh, the picture of Europe is characterized by diversity. So um, I should say first, the sweep to the far right is by far not as big as it had been expected, and it is not uncontested. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is a signal which is worrying since the product, the immediate product is instability in France as one of the most important European countries, which led to the uh, swift decision of President Macron to dissolve the Assemblée Nationale and to call for elections by the end of June. The uh, second point which needs to be marked is uh, the German government uh, really got a big slap into the face. And uh, we will see in Germany as a big European player a period of instability 
for the months to come. I do not know how the government will get out of this mm. self-produced trap, but uh, they is, suffered uh, a tremendous defeat, and one should not forget to mention that the three governing parties got less votes than the biggest opposition party alone. And that doesn't bode well for the stability of the German government. And with these two uh, big countries in in the risk of instability, we have a situation in Europe which is not adequate to the challenges we are facing, be it in the Middle East, be it in Ukraine. There are, on the other hand, positive developments which one should mark. I will not talk about the Netherlands since we have Uri among us. Uh, but we see also uh, positive trends in Poland, where the uh, party of the former president Kaczynski didn't win uh, mm. much to the contrary. Uh, then you may talk about I Italy, but um, it seems to me that uh, Signora Meloni has proven to be a factor of calculability and stability in the uh, past month, particularly with regard to Ukraine and uh, to some extent also with regard to the Middle East. Um, I think these are factors which need to be mentioned, but all in all, I'm, you can imagine I'm not entirely happy since I do not see uh, a quick decision on the uh, Commission. Uh, I do not see that President Macron will be able to cast his vote on the 16th of June as foreseen, since he is right in the middle of an election campaign. And whether the time schedule will then change and how that, what that will mean for the nomination of a new high representative, which really needs to be replaced. And I, I can fully <laughs> agree to the undertone of the previous statement that Borrell was definitely not a factor of calculability and stability in the past few months, very much to the country, and it's high time that it would be relieved. Alas, uh, High Representative Borrell uh, has not kept uh, European interests at heart when uh, conducting his affairs, which rather uh, his own uh, perceptive understanding of how things uh, should be in accordance with his own interests. And many times you saw it throughout his statements uh, over the past uh, almost five years, where he time and again came out and declared that this is not a European position, but rather the, the sentiments that he interprets from the European position, something that obviously should never occur within uh, the limitations of a mandate granted to any uh, European official. But uh, Professor Rosenthal, uh, I'll take the Netherlands also as an example, while uh, Geert Wilders, who was the big uh, victor in the national elections, he made also significant gains, but has not managed to secure a majority that was initially projected. Yeah, that's right. But there's a big but here, and that is the turnout at the polls, at the uh, ballot box. Uh, the turnout in the Netherlands was rather low, as usual, with the uh, European Parliament elections. And uh, if you would uh, transpose it to uh, the turnout for the uh, uh, general elections for the national parliament, the picture would have been different. Nevertheless, it is a psychological uh, 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 minor blow for the... Uh, for uh, Geert Wilders that he did not make it uh, to become the biggest, uh, the largest party in the European uh, elections. As, by the way, the same holds for Belgium, where the Flemish interest group lost actually the first place to the uh, right-wing uh, liberals. So uh, that is to be said. Well. For the rest, let me say that I can uh, repeat what um, has been said already. It is definitely in the European Parliament to shift to the right. Uh, the loss on the left side is uh, more than 60 seats out of 720. Uh, remarkable for me is, of course, the huge 
defeat of uh, President Macron in France to uh, Marine Le Pen uh, with the snap elections as the immediate uh, 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 follow-up. Germany, uh, uh, Klaus didn't mention it, but CDU, CSU, the, Bi the Bavarian part of it, uh, took uh, a solid 30%. Plus the alternative for Deutschland, 16%. So that is nearly 50% of the vote there. Italy has been mentioned. And let me also uh, mention Spain, where the People's Party plus uh, the uh, uh, Vox Party took together 40%, uh, which is, of course, very interesting seeing when we take into consideration the... Um, uh, campaign of the uh, prime minister in Spain to uh, uh, go uh, to be a front runner in the anti-Israel coalition in Europe. With regard to the key positions, let me make three re one remark. We are talking here the European uh, Commission, where I would say think that uh, Ursula von der Leyen will be able to uh, prolong her mandate, although there are intricacies. Interestingly, very interesting will be the chair of the European Council, which is now in the hands of the Liberals with Charles Michel Belgium, or was in his hands. And also, of course, interesting is uh, the High Representative. Uh, and there, we see that it is now in the hands of the Social Democrats. And here we go. It could be that, after all, with the political families in the uh, European Parliament, that the Liberals will actually lose their third place to a amalgam of um, the right uh, votes in the European Parliament. So here we go. I, I would not be surprised if uh, there will be a uh, change in uh, the political f in the uh, positions in the European Council, which after all is, if you could say it in that way, the uh, top agency in Europe, and also a change of uh, a change in the. Uh, sphere of the European, uh, of the high representative. And there, I would say that the biggest asset for Israel would actually be that uh, Joseph Borrell would be out and not be replaced by a sort of uh, uh, like-minded guy or girl, and that the high representative position would uh, change to the right. Well, uh, we can only hope, of course, but uh, we received a good mapping of uh, the European composition right now, a drastic shift to the right uh, in, in all uh, the, the aspects, not necessarily only the, the far right, but also the conservative right, which are more institutional in uh, essence. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we saw also another element, and for that maybe uh, I'd like to return to uh, General Naumann, since there was also local council elections in Germany, in the eastern side of uh, the country particularly, we saw a dramatic victory by Alternative for Deutschland, uh, something that of course uh, was not necessarily expected to this degree, but they took the first place in most councils. Yeah, that's, that's true. The, uh, the elections, the decisive elections, the second round, was in most cases in Thuringia, where it took place, won by the uh, CDU, which is a, a good indication uh, that the voters in Germany uh, know what they have to do if the decision is about to be taken. And uh, that gives a little bit of hope. But all in all, I think it is the weakness of the central government which is reflected uh, by the votes of the people also in these local elections, since they do not see that the urgent problems of the country, the necessity to reform in many aspects, uh, a country which for much too long time believed that simply the formula go along 
in German weiter so is a recipe for success. And that was proven as the wrong uh, decision uh, by the voters. They want change, a moderate change. And uh, now the government in Berlin has to make up its mind. We will see pretty soon a decisive point there when the budget for 2025 has to be decided, which is at this point in time uh, an absolutely open question how they will manage to pretend that Social Security uh, is granted uh, in the way in which Germany lives, and at the same time the urgent needs for digitalization, for defense, for economic reform uh, will be addressed and will get the necessary resources. So I think Germany is uh, facing a very difficult national uh, situation in the coming months. And that doesn't bode well for the stability of Europe, since if uh, mm. France is involved in, an, uh, in a divisive election campaign, and Germany is unable to take uh, the necessary decisions, then I do not know how Europe will uh, make progress. Well, I, I think one thing that we can take out of this, or even two, and that is also in line with what General Nauman just mentioned, this was a vote of no confidence in the policies undertaken by not only the, the European Commission and, and the European Union at large, but uh, the the national governments uh, with regard to migration, with regard to the way the European Union operates within the international sphere, with a lot of aspects that have been imposed upon nation states within Europe that have been counterproductive to European societies, uh, if we put it plain and simple. Now, the, the stability of Europe leans on one key factor and key ingredient, and that is the stability and collaboration between Paris and Berlin, something that has been fractured for quite some time now, and as such also the projection towards neighboring countries, towards neighboring nations, all of that, of course, comes within a time of the uh, instability in Ukraine, uh, obviously due to the war, the, the war of aggression imposed by Russia upon uh, Ukraine, but also the Middle East. Uh, where is the Middle East coming into that context and what can you tell us about the Israeli angle? You can add to that uh, the uh, impact of Brexit. Of course, it's eight years uh, already, but uh, the trend towards a federal Europe uh, was uh, blocked and, uh, and reversed, and the weakness of American leadership. Yep. Because uh, whether it's NATO, which General Nauman knows uh, so intimately well, or the EU, the um, uh, look was towards Washington. And maybe we will see in the 75th uh, anniversary uh, some speeches about the, uh, what happens across the Atlantic. But the reality is a weak American leadership and a fractured Europe. Now, Israel is an Asian country, almost bordering Africa, if you take the Sinai, uh, and across the Suez Canal you have Africa. But Israel sees itself also as a European country because of Eurovision, because of uh, soccer <laughs> and other uh, sports, and because many of the founders of the Jewish state Western orientation came, came from Europe, in that case, Eastern Europe. Now, go back to the Oslo process. It was sponsored by Europeans. But then the EU has receded from center stage. Um, yes, there is the quartet in which the EU is one of the four members, but this is uh, only uh, declaratory. The EU does not have any policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel or the Middle East, which Israel can uh, concern itself with. Because if Borrell acts the way uh, he does, uh, people even miss uh, Mogherini and Ashton. And the JCPOA was perhaps the last uh, major event in which the EU really took uh, a part. It was one of the participants. 
um, vis-a-vis uh, Iran. Now, the only thing which the Israeli government wants from Europe is do not disturb. Indeed. Professor Rosenthal, why is the European Union or the European Parliament at that of any significance? We saw the European Parliament vote uh, quite overwhelmingly in support of censoring and designating the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps of Iran, uh, calling on the commission to follow suit, and yet the commission disregarded it. We saw Josep Borrell not even attend the European Parliament, despite repeated requests to do so. And uh, if we put things from a uh, concerted aspect, the the true legislator of the European Union is the Commission and not the Parliament, which only suggests amendments and all kind of uh, proceedings that uh, can or cannot be adopted based on the will of the Commission president. Well, you you have already said it, um, and and for that matter, I would I would. Uh, uh, I would actually focus uh, now on the uh, ruthless struggle which will take place about the top positions in the several uh, European uh, entities. The European Commission, uh, we already mentioned it, uh, von der Leyen, uh, the European Council, which will be very interesting indeed uh, for the very reason that, after all, when we look at the European Council, it is the Council of the leaders of the several member states, no more, no less. And of course, in the last uh, uh, in the last five in the uh, past five years, von der Leyen has all, has actually uh, dominated the scene um, at the expense of the chairman of the. Uh, European Council, Charles Michel, who is a weak, who was a weak politician. So I'm very, very keen on who will actually be uh, appointed the uh, uh, the leader of the the president of the European Council, and then of course we are again talking about a high representative. So that having been said, I would not. Uh, after all, underestimate the, uh, let me say, the swing now to a more right, uh, uh, to the right in the European Parliament per se, and especially uh, the fact that, and it was already mentioned, um, the fact that uh, we see a European Parliament now, also including quite some right-oriented parties from the Eastern Europe, from Eastern Europe, which all are focusing on national interests instead of a sort of overall European interest. And for and there, of course, one point which I would like to raise is. Uh, not not only uh, the Middle East, but also Europe by itself is now uh, uh, is now quite intriguing because we have this war in Ukraine uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and in the eastern part of Europe there are several parties, and also overall on this in this shift to the right there are voices which actually uh, hamper an unequivocal uh, anti-Russian stance in uh, Europe. So uh, the picture is for me rather mixed. Once again, I would strongly advise you to, you know, to pay much attention to who will actually, after all, after some months or so, will be chairing the European Commission, but also the European Council, and of course, the high representative position in Europe. Well, uh, one can hope that uh, those elected will bring about necessary reform to realize the aspirations and concerns of European citizens who are seeing the continent sweep 
uh, getting swept by uh, illegal migration, something that uh, the United States is right now also not strange to, uh, and that it's uh, uh, currently in a position where, albeit in a secondary as a secondary actor, the uh, European nations need to consider that we're in an age of strategic power competition with dire consequences for the future. Uh, in one sentence from uh, each of you, what should we focus on for the near future? General Nauman, we'll start with you. Well, uh, from my perspective, what we have to really pay heed to is the re-emergence of nationalism. And we should keep in mind what late President Mitterrand said, nationalism, c'est la guerre. Nationalism means war. Uh, that is the critical point at which Europe stands at this point in time. We have to combat the re-emergence of nationalism. Professor Rosenthal? I would say that uh, Apart from what is happening on the European level, you know, on the on the European Union level, I would uh, I would focus a lot on uh, the national issues, which are overall first and foremost on migration and asylum policies, and for the rest, I'm I would say that with regard to the Middle East. The uh, results of the European Parliament elections could have been worse than they are. And that is a euphemism, I I would say. I think that Israel can be positive on the way in which in Europe at least very anti-Israel sentiments are not being reflected in the uh, European elections, uh, European Parliament elections of the last week. Indeed. Thank you, Professor Rosenthal and General Nauman for your insights and time. And uh, Mr. Oren, of course, I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until our next update from here in Jerusalem, Shalom.